Sustainability Defined listeners note that Native Energy is our sponsor of this episode. They are experts in this important topic of soil carbon, and we thank them for their support. All right, listeners, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Scott and I are here defining sustainability one topic and one bad joke at a time. This is episode 47, our very first of 2020 on soil carbon. Scott, happy new year. Happy new year. It's like 2019 we're recording this, let's be honest, but 2020 is going to feel good, isn't it, Jay? Yeah, as, as far as how vividly I can imagine it, at least, it's a, it's a pretty nice start to the <laughs> a year. A whole new world. <laughs> All right, Scott, what is this first episode of 2020 going to look like? All right, Jay, this is a a nice topic in sustainability that I think really has a big impact. So what we're going to talk about is what is soil carbon? You know, just define it like we typically do. Then we'll get into why is soil carbon important. Third, we'll talk about the loss of soil carbon. Then we'll get into how can more carbon be stored in the soil? Then we'll explain barriers to storing more soil in the carbon. Jay, I really like this one. We always make sure to do this. What can listeners do to help keep more carbon in the soil? And then mm-hmm. we'll talk a bit more about native energy. All right, Jay, baseline us. What is soil carbon? Scott, listeners, soil carbon refers to the fact that soils hold a significant amount of carbon, more than three times the amount in the atmosphere. Only the ocean is a larger carbon sink than the soil. So to put that in perspective, Humans currently add a little over 4 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere annually. The world's soils contain 1.5 trillion tons of carbon in the form of organic material, or approximately 375 years worth of the carbon that we add annually into the atmosphere. Yeah, we better keep that carbon in the soil, huh, man? There's there's far too much to let go. (laughs) So how does all this carbon end up in the soil? Well, a couple different ways. One way involves photosynthesis, which we all remember from high school biology. When plants take carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, some of that carbon, along with nitrogen, gets fixed in the soil and acts as a fertilizer. A second way is that when leaves fall and plants decompose, their carbon is absorbed into the soil. Right, and... Scott, soil mainly holds the carbon through its organic matter. So organic matter refers to the fraction of the soil that is highly enriched in carbon since it consists of plant or animal tissue in various stages of breakdown. So think decomposition. Organic matter is really not a big component of the soil, though. Most of our productive agricultural soils have between 3 and 6% organic matter. And listeners note that the amount of carbon that soil can hold generally known as its carbon budget differs by soil type. So you have some clay-based soils that can actually hold more organic carbon for longer than sandier soils. Yeah, that always kind of blew my mind how there's different kinds of soil. You typically don't think about it, but it's a very interesting range of types of soil and it really matters for what you can grow and things like this. Certainly. And and Scott, in in the real estate industry, what you can build also. Interesting. Mm. Ah. All right, Scott, we've got the baseline. Tell us why soil carbon is important. So soils with more organic carbon contain more active microorganisms and nutrients, producing healthier plants and grazing animals. In other words, Jay, if we pull more carbon out of the atmosphere and into the ground, we'll get healthier ecosystems and lower CO2 in the atmosphere. Jay, it's our favorite, a win-win. We just love win wins Love it. So... Really quickly on climate change, let's do a refresher on the Paris Climate Agreement before we explain how soil carbon can help us meet our climate goals. So in Paris, countries agreed to limit the average increase in global temperatures to two degrees Celsius as compared with pre-industrial temperatures. They also agreed to try to keep the average increase below 1.5 degrees. The scientific community believes that above a 1.5 degree rise our natural system reaches a tipping point and the worst effects of climate change start to occur. So significant droughts, sea level rise, more frequent and severe storms, all of that day after tomorrow stuff, Scott. 
Yes, Parade of Horribles, and I love how they agreed, like, oh, what's agreed to two, but we'll try for that 1.5, which <laughs> is a tipping point. Okay. Well, to stay below 1.5 degrees, Jay, we need to limit our emissions and also enhance our carbon sinks. Soil is one of those sinks, and it's a big one. Mm -hmm. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is made up of the world's leading climate scientists, said in a 2019 report on climate change and land that the potential for soil carbon sequestration in croplands and grasslands is 0.4 to 8.6 of gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. So what does that mean? Well, the top end of that range is equivalent to almost 1.5 times the annual emissions of the United States. Right. Scott. So, so we're wow. talking... We're talking big capacities here. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S. specifically, cropland annually sequesters only 8.4 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, even though it has the potential to sequester 100 million metric tons each year. So over 10 times what it's currently sequestering. And then when we look at all U.S. soils, including cropland, grazing lands and other types, U.S. soils have the potential to sequester 288 million metric tons each year, which is the same as the greenhouse gas emissions from a little over 60 million cars, or 20% of all vehicles registered in the U.S. today. Okay, so maybe a simpler way to see this potential impact is consider the 4 per 1,000 initiative that France launched in 2015 at COP21 which is also where the Paris Climate Accord was reached. So France France was busy. That was, that was a big year. <laughs> yeah. The 4 per 1,000 initiative brings attention to the fact that a 0.4% increase in the carbon sequestered in the soil globally would be greater than the amount of carbon added to the atmosphere in 2015. So like we've been talking about, a lot of potential, not a lot of that potential is currently realized, and even little increases in the amount of soil sequestered means big impact. Yeah, that's right, Scott. When we're thinking about all these tools, we can think about these levers to pull. And it's interesting that this one could require such a little, you know, shift in that lever, but it would have a massive impact. Right. So it's pretty hopeful. But Jay, talk to us first about the loss of soil carbon that we've had over time. Right. So, all right, Scott, uh, forgive me for being a little bit of a downer here. So <laughs> part of why there is such a big opportunity to store more carbon in the soil is because our soils have lost a lot of carbon. It, it kind of kind of follows. This is largely due to humans altering ecosystems and intensively using land. So if you can believe it, the world's cultivated soils, and this is mind boggling, yeah. have lost between 50 and 70% of their original carbon stock. So, wow. so let that sink in. Over time, this carbon oxidized upon exposure to air and became CO2, which Scott, we know to be not so good news. Not good news. And the carbon lost from the soil has made up a pretty significant portion of the carbon building up in the atmosphere. Approximately two-thirds of the total increase in atmospheric CO2 is a result of burning fossil fuels, but much of the remainder comes from the soil organic carbon loss due to land use change. Common types of land use change include deforestation and clearing native plants for food production. So that's loss of soil carbon over time, but Jay, how can more carbon be stored in the soil? Let's get back to hopeful. Right. Thank you. I, I can finally get a chance to redeem this. Mm -hmm. Scott, we're going to discuss three big ways to do so. One is to restore grassland on former crop fields. This can reduce the carbon deficit caused from years of agricultural production. Carbon is sequestered as native grasses and plants develop deeper root systems, which pull and hold more carbon as compared to crops. Root systems are the coolest thing. Isn't it? When it, you think about they're like, so fascinating. how long oh, yeah. they are and all the things they're pulling and they like, yeah, I love it. And them. communicate. Oh, it's, exactly. it's so cool. So Scott, number two, as far as how more carbon can be stored in the soil is to create wetlands and ponds. So interestingly, wetlands contain a disproportionate amount of the earth's total soil carbon, holding between 20 and 30% of global soil carbon, despite only occupying five to 8% of Earth's land surface. Man, we got to do an episode on wetlands at some point. You even think about how people are also pointing to wetlands as something to have more of as a way to guard against hurricanes and such, right? Mm -hmm. they, they provide so mm -hmm. many benefits. Anyway, the anoxic conditions, meaning the low amounts of oxygen that are characteristic of wetland soils, they slow decomposition and lead to the accumulation of organic matter. So that's why they have that disproportionate amount of the Earth's total soil carbon. 
wetlands for the wind, Scott. Mm-hmm. All right. And number three, as far as how more carbon can be stored in the soil, and this is a big one, is to manage the land in a particular way to reduce carbon loss in the first place or even add carbon in. This is also known as carbon farming and regenerative agriculture. We are going to discuss four such management practices. Scott, why don't you start us off? Okay, Jay. Number one, increasing soil stability. This can be done via no-till agriculture, where crops are grown without disturbing the soil. Think of those big rigs that turn soil over on large farms. This practice can harm soil over time. We can also increase soil stability by employing agroforestry which is where crop cultivation is intermixed with growing trees and sometimes livestock grazing. Grazing is important to manage since overgrazing with all those cattle eating the grass, leaving the soil bare as they stomp around, releases stored carbon. Call back, Jay, to an earlier episode. Check out episode 23 on agroecology for more on this. Excellent. So number two, as far as carbon farming and regenerative agriculture is increasing plant and animal inputs. So listeners think manure and compost. This promotes large and diverse soil microbe communities that break down organic matter and store it as carbon. The microbes themselves also die and contribute to the soil organic matter. So Scott, fortunately their death is not for nothing. They're mm-hmm. productive. We can be proud of those pass. microbes. That's right. They were noble. <laughs> Rest in peace. Mm-hmm. So Then, Scott, we also have biochar, which can increase organic inputs as well. This is where organic waste, think trees, crop residues, grass, or other plants, is burned in an oxygen-free chamber and then buried where, under certain conditions, it might sequester carbon for hundreds of years. Do you think biochar kind of sounds delicious? Like, oh, it's got that kind of burnt taste that I sometimes like, you know, like when you burn a marshmallow and s'mores. fresh off the grill. Uh I don't know. Uh Uh-huh. Anyway. I'm Number three, <laughs> increasing plant diversity and rotating crops. So increased plant diversity and rotating crops can increase that microbial activity and build more diverse micro communities. And Jay, plant diversity is definitely something we can work on. This is a good early party fact here. It's, we need like a, some sound effect of like party fact alert. Uh, Ding. Uh, yeah. Of the 6,000 <laughs> plant species cultivated for food, just nine of those account for 66% of total crop production. So we don't have a lot of diversity thinking big picture of the amount of plant species we're cultivating for food. No, Scott, we've been dropping some some solid facts in mm-hmm. this episode. Listeners, your next party will thank you. Someone researched this really well. Who did that? Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> so lastly, as far as regenerative agriculture practices, we have planting cover crops. So this is where plants are grown on fields after picking, not to harvest, but so that the land is not bare, which makes it less susceptible to disturbance. These crop residues then decay and add carbon to the soil. One study estimated that using cover crops on 25% of the world's farmland could offset 8% of emissions from agriculture. So definitely not insignificant. Yeah, plus there's some win-win action here, Jay, because these practices to add carbon in the soil have co-benefits. They also boost soil productivity and increase resilience to floods and drought. This is why a recent United Nations report found that the economic benefits of land restoration average 10 times the costs. So sell all your stocks, put them in <laughs> put them in cover crops because that's quite the return. All right, Jay, we've Done the hopeful, we got to go back to not so hopeful. What are the barriers to storing more carbon in the soil? What's what's holding us back from doing these things? Scott, I hear that this is falling on my shoulders every time. Yeah. Listeners, we're, we're going to pull through. So, Scott, for farmers, managing their land to increase sequestration of carbon comes with trade-offs. For instance, tilling, which, as we mentioned before, is not so great for storing carbon since it involves disturbing the soil, is often done to control weeds. And then more generally, these practices may involve investment in new equipment and more time and result in less land available for cultivation. These can be tough things to add to farmers' already full plates. Right, and it can also be difficult to explain the benefits of soil carbon sequestration since there is uncertainty as to how much sequestration will come from applying certain practices to varying soil types. Another barrier is that many people rent their land 
which creates less of an incentive to invest in the long-term health of the soil. I know I rent my apartment. I don't have much incentive to improve this apartment. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> Scott, let's hope your landlord's not listening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, in the U.S., renters operate almost 40% of farmland. So there's a lot of renters out there, which is more yeah, than Scott, that was think. actually f- far higher than I would have expected. Yeah. So I wonder if there's like uh, big landlords, you know, who own a lot of this farmland that rent it out. Yeah. And like the tenants get all in trouble because they leave their farms a mess. You know, they didn't pick up their like yeah. drinks and food and stuff. And then you got to talk to Farm B&B and sort it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Farm B&B, I sense an opportunity. Yeah. I will not get off on a tangent on my recent Airbnb uh, tension, but. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. Maybe I'll share that on social media or something. <laughs> if some <laughs> listeners are like, what was that? We Scott, I think we should Airbnb listening. moving on here. <laughs> okay. So what can listeners do to help keep more carbon in the soil, Jay? So, Scott, number one, we have biochar, which we mentioned earlier. And admittedly, this can be a tough one since we're pretty sure that most of you don't have your own large farms in your backyards. and Or industrial farm... strength charers. Right. Or, of course, Scott, until farm B&B actually becomes a thing. Mm-hmm. Also, some of these biochar practices are fairly intensive, For example, we did see one article on DIY biochar, but honestly, that seemed a little much for the average person. Not for the extreme hippie, though. And Jay, I'm kind of counting on some listener to go to the show notes on our website. We have linked to the DIY biochar (laughs) site, and then I want to see pictures, and we will post it and give you a total shout out if you somehow make this happen. And instant fame, not to mention. Yes, instant fame. All right. So (laughs) biochar, maybe not so much, but- Offsets is something, Jay. <laughs> we thought soil carbon offsets that people could purchase would be a thing. But apparently, storing carbon in soil has traditionally been excluded from carbon markets because it was difficult to measure how much carbon goes into the soil and how long it stays there. This is part of why there are pretty large differences in the maximum amount of carbon that soils could potentially hold. Further, warming temperatures are thought to compromise the soil's ability to store carbon. Good news is, there are some agritech startups like Indigo Agriculture that are looking into creating carbon markets to incentivize farmers to adopt more regenerative practices. In addition to Indigo, other leaders on this are Nori, Soil Health Institute, and Green America. Next, as far as how listeners can promote soil carbon, we have the old conscious consumer approach. So Mm -hmm. one thing you can do, listeners, is tell companies to keep up their soil carbon efforts as a part of how they grow food. For example, and we have some big companies that are already moving on this, some big names including Cargill, General Mills, McDonald's USA, and Mars launched the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium. It encourages farmers and ranchers to adopt conservation management practices to improve soil health and reduce emissions. Speaking of General Mills, it recently announced it would apply regenerative agriculture to 1 million acres by 2030. This is about a quarter of the land from which it sources ingredients in North America. This kind of serious commitment makes sense since 50% of General Mills' greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. So I guess this means you can eat your lucky charms and feel a bit better about it. Listeners, we also have other consumer goods companies that are pushing this stuff. The yogurt company Stonyfield Farm is developing tools to help farmers easily monitor soil health and learn how to sequester more carbon. And Danone North America recently announced $6 million over five years to fund a soil health research program as a part of its regenerative agriculture commitment. And there are products you can buy that were grown in a way to help sequester carbon. For example, Patagonia came out with a beer and Cascadian Farms came out with a limited edition breakfast cereal made with Kernza. This is a type of wheat grass that is a perennial crop. Perennial crops do not need to be replanted each year. This means farmers can avoid plowing the soil, that tilling we talked about that releases carbon. That supply of Kernza is limited for now, but there is the expectation that availability of Kernza-based foods will increase. So I guess look out for the Kernza. I'm Kernza excited, Scott. Maybe it's it's 2020 is the year of the Kernza. (laughs) Well, we're here now, Scott. It's 2020. I have a good feeling about it. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Scott, let's transition now to Native Energy, who we're going to be speaking with coming up in our interview. Native Energy is a public benefit corporation and B Corp that since 2000 has worked with hundreds of organizations to develop 
authentic solutions to their sustainability challenges and implement community scale projects. They're really a perfect group to talk further with about soil carbon because some of those solutions and projects focus directly on soil carbon. So for example, they recognize that while regenerative agriculture practices can increase yields for ranchers and farmers over the long term, in the short term, they can be too expensive to implement. So they started the Montana Improved Grazing Project. This project provides farmers financial support for implementing regenerative grazing practices, such as high intensity rotational grazing, relieving pressure on waterways so riparian zones along the water can regenerate, and adding compost, soil microbes, and other symbiotic soil species to the soil. The project started with 35,000 acres under management and tends to expand to 250,000 acres by 2021 and scale from there. The project is funded via Native Energy's Help Build model. Unlike most carbon offsets, sold year by year from projects that are already built and operating, Help Build investors finance projects with upfront funding needs and a longer term payback. We're going to hear more about this in the interview. We're going to dive deeper on soil carbon with two members of Native Energy's team, Jennifer Cooper and Jeff Bernicki. Jennifer Cooper is the VP of Client Strategy at Native Energy. She's been involved in corporate sustainability since 1998 with a stint at Volvo and supporting companies like Johnson & Johnson and Coca-Cola. She's based in Pittsburgh, but has lived in many countries, including Sweden, where she got her master's in environmental management and policy. Man, since 1998, it really was not that big of a thing at that time. So she's been Head of the curve for, for sure. Bit. Jeff Bernicki now is the president and CEO of Native Energy. He has over 25 years of experience building and leading teams in the development and financing of renewable energy, emissions reduction, and impact projects and programs. He led the development of the Help Build model we just mentioned in a variety of environmental areas. Jay, you're going to love this. He's got his MBA and MS from the University of Michigan. Go Blue. Go Blue. Wow, it's got a, it sounds almost even better to hear you say it. Well, a tip of the hat to my brother on that one. Go Hoosiers. Oh, okay, excellent. For me. Also, to the delight of both our ears and our feet, we will be speaking to Hannah Kajimura, who leads sustainability at Allbirds. Allbirds is an increasingly popular footwear company from New Zealand that uses natural materials like merino wool, eucalyptus tree fiber, and sugarcane in its super comfy shoes, which I happen to be wearing, Scott, right now. No way. And my roommate wears them. I don't have a pair, but I do like that you can you can put them in the washer, right? And like clean yeah. them? Yeah, yeah, they're they're super versatile, and like we're, we're not getting paid by Allbirds to say this, but I, yeah. I honestly love them. All right, well, I'll be waiting for your Allbirds for my Hanukkah present. Ah, uh, wow, Scott, it's already January 2020. I clearly have missed the boat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the interview. All right, listeners, we are now at the interview portion of our Soil Carbon episode. We are very pleased to bring you uh, two folks from Native Energy. We have Jennifer Cooper and Jeff Bernicki actually continuing the tradition here of being in multi-places. I don't know if multi-places is a word, but Jennifer is in Pittsburgh. Jeff is in Burlington. I think he's got a pint of Ben & Jerry's in front of him. No, he doesn't because it's like 10 in the morning. Uh, But I wouldn't hold you against it if you did. So Jeff and Jennifer, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, Jeff and Jennifer, and, and as we go, you can just take these however you want, but how did you end up at Native Energy? How did you get started in this industry? Uh, you know, I think listeners want to hear about your story. Well, I started developing projects, making investments in renewable energy, and as climate became more and more of, a, of an issue, uh, I, got, I moved into developing uh, not only renewable energy, but projects that lower greenhouse gas emissions. And Native Energy, from my perspective, had a very interesting business model, which was um, let's finance projects up front and um, basically create a market, um, a, create an investment model that gets money to projects that wouldn't otherwise uh, get the financing, um, would not be, would not have traditional financing me- mechanisms available to it. And so that attracted me primarily coming from a large energy background to doing something that connected to 
to not only um, companies, but also to the communities in which these projects operated. And, and to me, that was a very innovative business model. And it, it also tapped into, me, tapped into my interest around creating investments for companies that help, create, that help increase value for those companies. Okay. So, Jennifer, do you want to tell us a bit about how you got into this field or to Native Energy? Sure. So in 1998, so I began working at the product design level and sustainability, so measuring environmental impacts of products. And the Bulls won the championship that year, so it was a very good year. Great year. <laughs> uh, and finding ways to incentivize new design to reduce the impacts coming from specific products. So working with brands part of that time in the United States, part of that time in Europe. Um, I became interested in native energy because the focus is on great climate actions that are stalled and finding ways to fund and build to make those actions happen. And I wanted to contribute to this really tangible and lasting type of change. Excellent. So, so here native energy exists to Jennifer, as you said, kickstart these sustainability environmental initiatives that that need help getting off the ground to make the impact that we want to see. So now let's transition along those lines to this idea of soil carbon. So, you know, we've talked energy, we've talked financing, and for the listeners out there, they might be thinking, okay, well, how are we going to get to talking about soil? So to, to both of you, how were you exposed to this idea of soil carbon at Native Energy before we start to drill in a little bit deeper? We started looking into soil carbon as a way to to take climate action about three or four years ago. And as we were working through all of the different project types that, that we that we go through in the course of a year, soil carbon started to come up as one of the biggest solutions that that could be implemented both in the US as well as uh, internationally. Um, along the ag supply chain to address climate. In other words, sequester carbon in the soil. As we started working with different producers, we started going to different um, events and roundtables, I think we realized that this is exactly where renewable energy was about 20 years ago, where there was no funding, no financing mm. for these community-scale projects. And so you know, internally, we kept saying, you know, soil is the new wind, and there needs to be a financing mechanism that can be uh, deployed here, because what we're seeing is producers, ranchers and farmers, are not putting the money in up front, because they don't see the carbon markets, or they don't see any sort of these impact investment markets really coming into fruition um, in the foreseeable future. And while they see a benefit to these practices from a productivity perspective, they don't have the upfront money or the tolerance for risk to put it all down to change over in these practices. And at the same time, this is three or four years ago, through all these conversations, we were talking to companies, to brands, to especially in the ag sector, and or that were exposed to the ag sector, sector saying, we want to source our products or our commodities from farmers and ranchers that are deploying these practices. And we want to help sequester carbon in our supply chain. But when we got together and we started discussing with farmers and companies together, the question that, I, that, that we would provide to these, these farmers, we'd say, okay, if you, can do, if you can deploy these practices, how much does it cost? And how long are you willing to conduct these practices? We go to the companies. How how much money are you willing to pay for these sustainable, these regenerative soil practices, and how long are you willing to go? And none of those questions were being asked. Everybody said we want to do it, but the, the specific questions around doing a project, implementing a project, and financing it were not being discussed. And that's where we thought, boy, Native Energy has a role to play here. There's this big white space that nobody is making the connection and actually doing long-term scalable projects in soil carbon. Great. So Jeff, fantastic context. So here we have Native Energy, who is essentially connecting the dots between projects that cannot be financed, cannot find their funding, 
and groups that will be willing to fund them and, and trying to find that middle ground as far as how we can align risk and, and return metrics. So Jennifer and Jeff, in the intro, we touched on the connection between grazing practices specifically and soil carbon. And we now like to start drilling deeper into this idea of grazing. So could you walk us through the role of grazing and storing carbon in the soil and then relate how big of an impact can actually be made via this technique? Traditionally, our grasslands, and we're talking about uh, North America, Northern prairies, our grasslands um, evolved with, with the bison and the large migratory um, herds that would go through and and really just almost destroy these grasslands. What they would do is they would graze them down and they would trample on, on, on large swaths of, of these grasslands and then they'd move on and they wouldn't return to those, those areas for maybe a year, two years, maybe even longer. And those grasslands would then, uh, would, would then grow back um, and, and all along, as this kept going, you know, repeatedly, those grasslands developed really large, long uh, root structures and very, very rich carbon um, in, in the ground. And they were very, very productive. So this, these regenerative grazing practices um, are, are meant to reestablish that natural progression or that natural rotation in those grasslands. And what we do is we basically divide up the pastures or the ranchers divide up those pastures into multiple pastures. And then they more intensively graze each of those divisions, but then they move them to the next pasture or the next cell um, and then rotate them all the way around so that so that that provides rest for for each of those individual pastures. Right. So, Jeff, let's say you want to do this rotational grazing and you know, give this give this land a rest, which is understandable. You know, they need some they need some, some beauty sleep here. So. If I'm a farmer, though, and we keep talking about the cost of this, that doesn't sound crazy expensive. Is it because maybe otherwise they would be using all of this land? Like, what, what is the cost associated with this rotational grazing, and how does the help build model allow the farmer to do this? So maybe walk us through those two parts, if that's okay. So first, why is it so expensive to do this, and how does help build help them overcome that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm going to deploy that term, beauty sleep. We're gonna we're gonna somehow <laughs> integrate that because I think that would be a great uh, marketing tool. Everybody needs their beauty rest. Um, mm -hmm. So, first of all, the upfront cost in order to, to convert over to these to these practices. Number one, you need fencing because you need to divide up those mm. pastures. Number two, because you now will be constricting um, your your cattle in farther away pastures, you need to make sure that you have water across all of these new divisions. So. A lot of the investment is around the fencing and water, um, as well as, most importantly, it's, it's also the training and making sure or providing education and training to the ranchers and to their, and to their helpers. Okay, so fencing, water, training, those all sound expensive. Now can you walk us through the help build? Like how does a farmer reach out to you and know that you even exist? What are the terms? Uh, and it sounds like this money comes from brands that care about this issue, right? Yes. Um, or eventually it will come from brands that, that are, are, are very much caring about this issue. Now, what we provide, our help build model, as, well, as we stepped into this, we started working with and, and understanding the issue that the ranchers were facing, what they wanted to do, and what the costs were for each of those ranches. And we then worked with them on coming up with a co-investment model where we would commit certain funds up front to them to offset the, the water and the fencing and some of the training that would take. And do they have to pay you back? Um, no, that, front, that first, that first in, initial investment that we provide to them is, is, is a, it's an investment in the project. And, uh -huh. um, and then what happens is the carbon, the emission reductions from that project will then be used to, to, to go to, or will be sold to corporations that want to support those, 
those uh, those regenerative practices. Okay, and then by co-investment, do they pitch in a little bit too? Yes, we require that the ranchers are also putting money in to uh, to converting over to these practices and long term. We also require a long term commitment, twenty to thirty years, for them to continue these practices. So what we are aiming to do is to say, we will help you cover these costs and give you really quick payback or return on that. We'll help you access the resources that you need to trial and error, get through you know, the first months of this, the first year or so, until you figure out what works for you on the land. And we can do that because we've modeled an estimated amount of carbon. That if you stick to this for the, as Jeff mentioned, the 20 to 30 year contract period, um, we've modeled an amount of carbon that will be sequestered in the soil. So the alternative for the rancher would be to take all of that on themselves and then take their chances selling carbon credits in a broken carbon market. Um, and we, we put forward that that's not going to happen. That's not going to, and has not happened. It's not um, accelerating or causing the change that, that we all need to see in climate. So this puts forward a much more attractive proposition to ranchers, takes the risk out for them. And then the really important part, which that Jeff touched on, there's a low risk of reversal for this because there's lots of positive benefits for the ranchers after the first few years. Once those costs are, are dealt with and they start accruing the carbon in the soil, that's also the period that the nutrients start accruing, the productivity goes up. Um, so they don't, they don't need um, ongoing carbon payments to keep up with these practices. It's getting over that hurdle um, and deploying these practices at scale across their ranches that, that this help build model or, or helping to bring that carbon funding up front enables. And that matters with carbon because you need whatever intervention you're talking about, whatever climate action you're taking, it has to last, it has to endure, or that carbon's just going back up into the atmosphere six years later, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, this all sounds great, but, and we're making a very compelling case for following these types of practices, but do you ever have pushback from ranchers or farmers who might say, you know what, uh, I am not necessarily willing to invest this time and energy and, and maybe capital to do this on my farm, or perhaps, you know, I've, I've heard of this beauty sleep thing for my land. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with just regular sleep. Do, do you get that kind of pushback ever because it all sounds great but is there ever any friction yes certainly and we um this you know this only works with those ranchers who are who have some interest um so we put out there our offers and um the way that we can support and help the ranchers and those that are most interested join in and we're hoping as this grows and scales that it becomes more compelling for more and more ranchers to join in the ranchers with whom we work, and also the other ones that are very interested in this project, many of them believe in these practices. I mean, the pushback is is not around this is not going to work. It's around how do I make it work? And I don't know if I can make it work on my ranch. But once other ranchers can see, okay, here's how it works. Here's what the contract looks like. Here's what I'm I need to do. Here's how much money I can pull in. And long term, here's what I think is is the benefit. Now they start stepping up and saying, "I want to start working through. I want to work through some of these these. Um, uh, uh, I want to I want to work through this process here and see if I can do it on mine." So, so far in this conversation, I think we've done a good job of of taking this idea of grazing and then through the value propositions to farmers and the types of pushback you guys might receive connect this idea of grazing to the larger impact that soil carbon can have for our climate goals. So Scott and I touched on this in the intro about this potential for soil to store really quite a bit of carbon. So the question is, how quickly can we make these changes in agricultural practices like grazing to start realizing this potential? You know, so Jennifer, is this a five-year target? Is this a 10-year target? How, how would you define that time frame? The pace at which you can move from engaging with ranchers who are interested, 
um, evaluating what practices would work on the land that they have and that they would be willing to adopt over a long period, modeling how much carbon accrual may result from that, um, mm. and then deploying is a short time. It's a you know a one to one and a half year undertaking. The, mm. the longer bit is finding the ranchers, the local partner organizations who can help make the connection with those ranchers. So you talk a lot about driving this to scale, right? You're, like you're saying, and it sounds like if a farmer was willing to take it on, it wouldn't take that long to do. But I imagine finding these farmers and ranchers, ha- sitting down to have these conversations, walking them through it, setting them up with the financing takes a long time. Is there any reason to think that perhaps this should be a bit more top down? Are there any government policies where you say, okay, actually, you kind of need to do this, and maybe there's government support for it? I don't know. But would that be a faster way to get this important soil carbon uh, increased? On the on the ranch lands, the the Bureau of Land Management (BLM). I mean, they promote these types of practices, maybe not at the scale or the intensity um, with which we're, we're deploying in, in our project, but there's certainly a support for that. And I know with, with the one sort of policy that a lot of producers, farmers especially, have, have lamented is the, the crop insurance with, with crops, with farms. Um, a lot of these regenerative practices, no-till, cover cropping, etc., actually increase the resiliency of the crops against any sort of uh, weather, extreme weather events. And, but they don't, wouldn't qualify for the crop insurance or anything like that. It's all driven by uh, conventional practices. And, and so I think that's a, a, a big lever that, that wow. could be used and changed um, to provide incentives for, uh, for farms, especially to, to, um, to deploy some of these regenerative practices. So Jeff, that's interesting. So are you saying that if I'm a farmer and I want crop insurance, and then I go off and do these regenerative practices, I can't get money now through the crop insurance if my yields aren't what they should be? Right, because you're not using the prescribed methods and the the fertilizer, Mm. et cetera. And, And that, I know, has really frustrated a lot of farmers that say, you know what, I'm I'm actually, I'm lowering my exposure yeah. uh, to uh, to these to these hazards, but I I don't I don't benefit from that, so I don't have you know I don't have as much of as of an incentive as some of these others that would maintain those conventional practices. That to me seems like it would be a you know a really good area to no brain to explore. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. And Jeff, you mentioned the crop insurance is something that needs to be changed to align with creating the incentives so people can do these practices. Are there any examples of policies, maybe at the state level, where they are done right and that they do take into account these regenerative practices? There are some federal programs like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which under the Department of Ag provides um, payments, dollars per acre, for cover cropping and other practices, conservation practices. And that does filter down into the state level. Um, that funding, though, it tends to tend to get turned on and off depending on on the year and depending on um, the 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 supply of the funding. But if farmers were able to count on that, that has had some 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 positive effect on farmers and seeing the benefits of deploying those practices. So I think that's another opportunity as well. Okay, so Jeff, this is really fascinating. We've we've touched on this insurance landscape oftentimes with misaligned incentives with these types of regenerative practices. We've touched on government policies that may actually be helping move some of this stuff forward. Let's touch a new segment now that that we know you all are directly involved with, which is the intersection of business and soil carbon. So we know that many companies have come out and set goals to be carbon neutral by, you know, pick a date, 2030, 2040, 2050. And these looming questions are, how are they going to get there? And, and what role does soil carbon sequestration play? So the question to you is, are there any companies in particular 
that have made soil carbon sequestration or soil health commitments that you really admire? With regard to the companies and and maybe the you know uh, those that we would we would look look to as far as leadership, um, there are quite a few companies, and and I think you've mentioned them: General Mills, McDonald's, Danone, um, several others that are also participating in this ecosystem services marketplace consortium of which we're we're a member as well. And there is a lot of interest, and there's I think a lot of um, effort being put by these companies to understand and to create the, the rules around counting, quantifying um, carbon sequestration, and then utilizing those, those, the, the, those projects to, to meet their, their climate goals. The problem is, number one, you have the sustainability folks in these companies that are really pushing hard, and I think they're, they're really on the cutting edge, and they're really working hard, and they're putting money into research, et cetera, and understanding these things and creating the ground rules. But when you look at taking action and putting investment money down, you have to bring in your finance folks. When you look at a long-term investment in a region, let's say sourcing wheat or corn or something like that, now you've got your your supply folks or your procurement, they like to operate year to year and they like to have flexibility to move wherever they need to move. So it requires all the parts in those companies to work together and to get that commitment. I think that's where they are right now is to understand what the opportunities are, what are the risks and what's the capital that's going to be needed to put into these types of large scale projects so that they can source and they can reduce emissions from these regions and they can count those towards their goals. So we're seeing, I think right now in the market, we're seeing a big push to understand, to create some rules, et cetera, to create some clarity. Um, but we're not seeing the big investments in, in, in a lot of taking action. And I think that's where native energy has always been, let's do it and let's really exercise the system and, and exercise everybody's you know um, enthusiasm here. And that can provide an example so that now they can take something like we have in Montana or we have a project in the Palouse region with wheat. They can see those structures and they say, okay, here's how it works. Here's how much it costs. Here's what we can do. And we hope that that will provide additional information for these larger companies to then see an avenue to take action. Great. So, so Jeff, I think you did a great job of outlining that process. So number one, we can set our goals. Number two, we can move into accountability. But number three is this implementation hurdle, which as you're describing, often involves folks from different departments in a single organization that might have competing interests. So I think you lay the table nicely for what sounds like native energy is able to come in and, and provide, which is essentially a brokerage opportunity between the companies that want to invest in these projects as a part of their goals with, as we talked about earlier in the interview, projects that need the funding to get off the ground. Is there a particular company that you look to that's, that's done this well? Well, I mean, I would point to, I would point to Ben and Jerry's number one, Ben and Jerry. Is this because you're in Burlington? Yeah, that doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So biased. Come on, I have to, well, look. Every now and then, yes, I've got some Ben and Jerry's you in know, my uh, uh-huh. refrigerator, and and for the for the love of ice cream, I, we've got to solve the climate <laughs> crisis. Have you met Ben and or Jerry? Uh, Jerry, yes, I've met Jerry. Okay. okay. Um, Full um, disclosure: and, the office at any time, the freezer is packed with Ben and Jerry's. Mm. And full disclosure: like we do those guys. Ben and Jerry's, um, but Ben and Jerry's they established their their targets, but before they established their targets, they established a funding mechanism, a fund that would that would be would, that would be put towards financing climate initiatives such that they could make good on their targets in 2025 and 2050. And so Jeff, were these the climate commitments that Ben and Jerry's made, were they soil specific or the funding soil specific or it just so happens that they made these carbon goals, they set aside the money and it just made sense to fund soil related projects. I'm just curious how specific they got around soil with this action. Well, yeah, well, it's a caveat there. Um, soil is on their radar, but uh, the fund was for all emissions and okay. associated with their ingredients, 
and um, and dairy, etc. And so some of the projects that they're looking at do focus on soil. Okay, so I can feel bad about maybe eating too many calories, but I can feel good about some of my purchase going towards carbon action, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> great would... news to all fish food lovers out there. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I think that it's great we ran through this example with Ben and & Jerry's and some of these other corporates that have taken serious action around this, but I bet our listeners are like, okay, that's great that some of the companies are – making goals around this, making products that might be able to help with soil carbon. But what can I do as an individual other than maybe be a little bit more conscious in my purchases? You know, I may, I might have a backyard that I garden, but otherwise soil I don't think too much about. What can our listeners do about this? Uh, what, what do you recommend to your friends that say, oh, I, you, you work on soil carbon, very interesting. How can I get engaged? What, sh- what should I do? There are certainly brands with goals for regenerative agriculture more broadly. So you have Patagonia, Dr. Bronner's, Allbirds, Timberland is among those companies, a number of brands that are, and you can take a look and see what they're talking about and what they're reporting, but they're saying we, we want our materials to come from crops and livestock that are raised with these regenerative practices, more restorative to the earth. To have those companies taken the step to fully quantify the carbon and, and the things that we're talking about, that may not be the case yet. And, but for, for consumers at a consumer level, looking for organizations and brands that are um, actively supporting uh, and investing in a transition to more regenerative practices in agriculture is a great start. And get into farming, get into ranching, or positively support people that you know who are thinking of doing that. Um, I think it's a vocation that we all depend on, and that goes without saying, but um, one that should be viewed with um, real awe. I mean, that this is where our food is coming from, Mm -hmm. this is where many of our goods are coming from, and we can do this in a way that is so grounded in science and so such an exciting part of the future and the solution to our climate crisis. Um, so that's. And, and visit farms too. I remember when I was um, a camp counselor in Northern Wisconsin, we had a bus cruiser day, we called it, where we took like five cabins, like 50 kids worth on a bus. I took them on a bus out in the community and I organized this trip to the farm and the guys that were the campers back then, this is like six, seven years ago, still bring this up. It's like, dude, you brought us to like see cows pooping and all this stuff. I was like, yeah, but you remember it, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's it's a good experience, I think, to, to check out farms and, and see how they're making the food we depend on. Well, Scott, I think I speak for all of us when I say that I wish you had been my camp counselor mm-hmm. growing up. But <laughs> Jennifer and Jeff, yeah, let's, let's transition now to our last question for you, which is our party fact question. So let's say, you know what, let's say we're on one of Scott's field trips and we're going to a farm that's practicing regenerative practices. They have a strong emphasis on soil carbon and healthy soils. And we want to share with all of our fellow campers, one party fact that will like Scott's guests way back when, they'll never forget. They'll carry this on forward and they will share with their friends about how important soil carbon yeah. is to a healthy climate. They'll drop their s'more. <laughs> Hopefully not in a cow pen. <laughs> so, so Jennifer and Jeff, what's one party fact about soil carbon that they will remember for years to come? Well, soil holds over three times the amount of carbon than all living plants. Wow. No kidding. So underground greater than above ground when it comes to storing carbon, which like uh, you don't really think about because we put so much emphasis on planting more trees, which we should. Yeah. But certainly soil in terms of potential uh, really is where we can make a big impact, huh? And when you think about all the carbon that our soils have lost, that just magnifies the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Scott, I am going to pass it along to all of my fellow campers. (laughs) Yeah, that'll be our uh, lights out story. You know, oh, the case of the lost soil. I don't know. They'll, they'll have nightmares. 
over that. that <laughs> gently dig into that soil. Don't take a big old spade and just, you know, turn it all over. Just, you know, a little hole and just put the seed in there and then you keep that mm-hmm. soil, that, that carbon down there. <laughs> and so, Jeff and Jennifer, if, if the listeners want more information on soil carbon or you all, where should they go? The Soil Health Institute is a, is a good place to start. And, and you'll see some other uh, uh, links from that. Excellent. And of course, if listeners want to learn more about Native Energy itself, I believe you guys are located at nativeenergy.com. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. We can't make it simpler than that. Excellent. Well, Jennifer and Jeff, we can't thank you enough for joining us to talk about soil carbon, which, as we just discussed, is an underappreciated component of our global climate goals. So again, thank you for joining us. And we are really glad to have shared the story with our listeners to push these issues forward. Thank you for being interested in the topic and would encourage anyone out there listening to find a great partner on this and get started. Thanks a lot, guys. And now let's transition to my conversation with Hana Kajimura, sustainability lead at Allbirds, to see how an exciting new company is focusing on this important topic of soil carbon. All right, listeners, I am now joined by Hana Kajimura, who is the sustainability lead at Allbirds. Hana, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. I'm thinking that the first thing that comes to mind for our listeners when we say all birds might not be soil carbon, although snuggly feet would be, obviously. Help us connect these dots. How did a footwear company like all birds end up with this focus on soil carbon? And then the next question being, how are you incorporating this focus into your specific climate action plans? It happened pretty organically. I think we started by trying to optimize for sourcing the lowest carbon materials possible and make, making sure we were doing that in the most responsible way possible. Our three main materials are wool, tensile, which comes from the eucalyptus tree, and sugarcane. Over time, we realized that not only do we have a responsibility to just make sure we don't do any harm, but that natural materials have such a huge opportunity to actually do a lot of good and can be a big part of the climate solution by drawing down carbon into the soil and acting as these natural carbon sinks. So it was really this realization that if we wanted an ambitious climate target and we wanted to achieve net neutrality, natural materials are an important piece of that solution. Help us connect just that last link. So so we have these sheep farms and you're bringing this holistic approach to how we're sourcing ingredients. Take, take us literally down to, to ground level. So what is that connection then to soil carbon specifically? Taking it from the highest level, we make a shoe. The upper of the shoe is made from a wool textile. Wool obviously comes off a sheep's back because they need their annual haircuts. And what was important to understand as a business over time is that Sheep as ruminant animals just by existing emit methane when they burp. So it's it's not the lowest carbon material, but we just have to believe that uh, a natural renewable product like that is better than a finite resource we drill out of the ground. And the light bulb moment for us was understanding the link between livestock and, and sheep in particular with soil carbon and natural carbon sinks. So Livestock actually play a really important role in maintaining soil health, which then leads to larger carbon drawdown. So it, it really is great to see a company that has this holistic approach all the way down into the ground that its products are derived from. How are you incorporating this focus on soil carbon that we've been discussing into Allbirds climate action plans? There really is no way for us to achieve our goals without natural carbon sinks and regenerative agriculture. So we committed to carbon neutrality from 2019 forward. We're doing that by imposing an internal carbon tax uh, on the business for all of the products we create that funds projects that reduce or avoid emissions. From this year, the way that we're doing that is by purchasing third-party verified offsets from projects around the world, working with Native Energy, Ultimately, 
we hope that 100% of our the materials that we source come from natural renewable sources and that 100% of those are uh, sourced regeneratively on farms that are both changing practice to increase the health of the land, increase biodiversity, increase water storage, but also, of course, sequester more CO2 than is being, than is being emitted. That's a very ambitious and long-term goal given the state mm-hmm. of, of regenerative and the science. But I think in the near term, what we're really tangibly looking towards in the next 12, 18 months is getting a project up off the ground at at least one, maybe a few of the wool farms in New Zealand that we source from and starting to see some real, really tangible practice change there. Practice change in terms of what exactly? Well, part of it involves getting a better understanding of baseline and what's happening today and how that compares to best practice when it comes to regenerative. But, you know, we can imagine things, specific practice changes like rotational grazing, uh, use of compost and other natural fertilizers, things along those lines to help draw down more carbon and make the soil even healthier. All right, Hannah, our last question for you is the question we ask to all of our guests on the show, which is if we are at a party and we're looking for some fact to share with (laughs) our fellow partygoers there who obviously are all wearing some sort of Allbirds shoes, of course. What might that party fact be about soil carbon that will stick with them for years to come? I'm sure you and your listeners are familiar with Paul Hawken and his book, Project Drawdown, where he lists out all of the, the different opportunities we have to solve the climate crisis. And originally, agriculture fell farther down on the list, but he has since come back to say that there are at least 20 different practices that constitute regenerative ag. And if all of those are added together, it represents by far the single greatest solution to the climate crisis. You know, Hannah, all of a sudden we've got a little bone to pick with Paul Hawkins because we had him <laughs> on the show maybe a year and a half ago. And I think at that point he hadn't summed up all those individual components that relate to regenerative ag, but that's a fantastic point and, and helps everyone, not only from the perspective of what food is on their plate, but now, you know, what shoes are on their feet as far as how we can redesign a system to to reverse this this global warming that's going on. Exactly. Super hopeful, really inspiring. Hana, thank you so much for joining us. And we're excited to share these insights with our listeners. Of course. Thanks for having us. All right, Scott, it is so clear that we need to wrap this episode down. The microbes have already started decomposing episode 47 so why don't we just let them do their thing we love the microbes though they'll work until they die and even after death we will still appreciate what they're doing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay jay so from microbes we go to a very important ask of our human listeners and microbe listeners too i guess (laughs) if you have any questions that you want us to answer in our next episode on sustainability and careers email us uh, hosts h-o-s-t-s at sustainabilitydefined.com we are excited about this episode we kind of teased it in the holiday hodgepodge and we want to be sure to answer your questions give you the information so that you can make your move in the sustainability world yeah scott this is a, a popular topic i know a lot of folks that have reached out to us have mentioned this is something they'd like to hear more about and so i know we're both super pumped about the opportunity to finally do it yeah so email us Next, listeners, we have a number for you. Our digits are yours. Call us, leave us a message on how you're advancing sustainability and hear your message at the tail end of one of our episodes. So call us at 202-670-7357. That's 202-670-7357. Leave us a message. Let us know how you're pushing sustainability in your life, your career, And who knows, you might be added to the end of one of our episodes. And I would say how to become the chosen one. Don't have it be too long and include a bad joke. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That would just be fantastic. Okay. Who do we want to thank for this episode? There's really only one other person that helped us, Jay, on this. And that's who else but my mom, Adrian Breen. Oh, my goodness. Gotta love her. (laughs) We'd also like to thank Potions and Square Peg Round Hole for the music we use in this episode. And of course, listeners, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. 
Scott, we had a phenomenal review come in recently. Why don't you read it aloud for us? Oh, Jay, this is one of my favorite parts of the episode, reading these reviews. Okay, so here's a one review from Bree Quinn. I have had this podcast added into my library for quite some time. Honestly, I've just been ignoring it. <laughs> recently, I ran out of other things to watch. LOL in parentheses. The podcast is wonderful, all caps, and it's a shame <laughs> I haven't been listening. I'm now catching up on all of the old episodes. I'm already very interested in sustainability. However, your podcast focuses on various topics I usually do not look into slash focus on. I really enjoy broadening my scope through your podcast without feeling like I'm listening to a lecture. Keep up the podcast. Bree Quinn. Scott, I just, I, just love, I just love the honesty. Uh, I found this podcast because I ran out of other stuff to do, but now that I found it, it's great. Well, she, she, did, she did put it in there. Right. She, and then she ran out of other things to do. True. So. Fair. Okay. Mm-hmm. Credit to Bree Quinn and thanks to Bree Quinn. Okay, Jay. I think that about does it. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time. <laughs>